Well, thank you, Neil, for sitting down to do this with, with us to keep the Portland Transport readers up to date on what's going on. My pleasure. So let me start with uh, the service cuts, yeah. since that's on everybody's mind. Um, often our readers will frame the issue as rail versus bus. Um, and I guess the way I think about it, having been involved in some of the policy making, is we have in this region a pretty uh, aggressive agenda of building a high capacity transit system. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily of cutting either the frequent service or the local buses, but uh, when we do get into down periods in the economy, because we've made long-term commitments to high capacity transit, that tends to be the effect. The only thing that's fungible during a time of cutting is uh, is typically the, the local bus service, the high frequency uh, bus service. Uh, and I see with the latest revisions to the cut package this morning that one, the cuts are greatly reduced, the service cuts are greatly reduced, the revenue pieces are still there, but certainly I think people will appreciate that the, uh, the service is not being reduced as much. But all the service cuts are on the bus side. There, as I understand it, there are no service cuts planned for max at this point, uh, a little bit for streetcar. Um, so how do we think about that from the equity point of view, uh, transit dependent riders versus choice riders, lower income versus higher income? Uh, a lot of people feel like the bus cuts may impact the more disadvantaged populations more. So how does, how does TriMet look at the equity impacts of that? Well, we look at it, first of all, there's an equity lens on everything we do, whether it be a fare issue or a service issue. The first thing I'd emphasize in relation to your question is that um, the cuts have been reduced. We have heard that loud and clear from our public surveys is, I wouldn't say people were in favor of fare increases, what I've always said is there's a tolerance for fare increases if the service can be kept whole. And so now we're down to a limited uh, $1.1 million worth of uh, bus service reductions, which out of a $432 million budget is pretty small. I would tell you another of the moving pieces within the overall budget, and we can talk further about this, is actually there are some service increases on other bus lines that are part of this overall budget. Uh, in particular, uh, the nine and the 12, and there's a, there's a couple others that we absolutely have to add service to in order to um, uh, deal with current crowding and, and service standards that we've got right now. So the first thing I'd say about the bus cuts is that we have put it through an equity lens, and the other part of it is that they are very surgical. So for the most part, there is some attempt uh, at looking at individual trips. And if we're, we've got a bus carrying one or two people, that's not what we do very well. Um, so we need to look at that, and because that's inefficient service. Um, and so that's what we've done in terms of these bus cuts. In addition, there's a couple other service changes that are uh, proposed, one in Northwest Portland where we deal with this line 17 and the number 16 and our current proposals, which I urge your readers to look at um, on the uh, trimet.org, is uh, actually to have the line 16 serve the Northwest Industrial Area, Linton, and Sylvia Island um, rather than number 17. That does save some money and also avoid some duplication in Northwest Portland, which I, we think is, uh, is a smart change. But there are also some other changes that are on that list. One is the line 47 and 48 being combined in Washington County to provide a better uh, east-west connection between uh, the Hillsborough Transit Center and Cedar Hills um, uh, area. Um, and that's a nice continuous route that I think builds a great base for improving service in the future. Similar change uh, is to connect the, the 73 with the 70. The 73 now is on 33rd Avenue in the Northwest Portland, um, the 70 on the 11th and 12th, and so connecting them provides uh, uh, opportunity and access to a whole series of connections between Northwest Portland and South, uh, Southeast Portland that uh, frankly were hard to, rep hard to get to uh, with the current configuration. So they've all been very studied, and I would tell you there's another, um, um, I'm sure we'll get into the union contract uh, at some certain will. points in time of this, but there's another minor point of this, which is that when we look at current MAX service, we, we have to add some service in the next year on uh, the MAX because of service standards. We've got crowding going on uh, during the peak hours. Um, and under the union contract, rail operators are full-time only. So unlike the bus operators where we can divide shifts and have part-time shifts or split shifts in some, some different ways, um, we don't have quite that flexibility on the rail system. So once we bring an operator in, 
they, they're around. So it makes it very hard to do targeted reductions on certain rail trips in the midday. Uh, now we've done that to the extent that we can, that uh, overlapping shifts can allow us to do that. Um, but it's just as a, as a technicality a little harder to get to. Okay. I would also tell you that, um, that for the most part the rail system is performing really well. And if you look at our cost per ride on the rail system, and this may be something we want to get further into as well, it's on the order of $1.64 per ride uh, compared to the bus system overall about $3 per ride. Uh, which begins to just tell you that economically it's performing well from a ridership standpoint. Uh -huh. It's serving a lot of people. Um, and so we have to be sensitive about that when we look at all of these connections. Right. I, I don't think we'd argue that um, the, the deficiency is not being achieved, but I think when we, when we look at equity, the yes. most efficient thing is not always the most equitable thing. And I guess just to contrast uh, and follow up a little bit, in the first round of proposed cuts, uh, I think there were two significant max reductions on the table. There was basically a frequency reduction uh, in the main Banfield corridor. I think from 15 minute headways to 20 minute headways and then there was the question of turning around the red line downtown versus um, versus in Beaverton and I can see where uh, turning turning around the red line early uh, would reduce a lot of capacity uh, I think the, the question is um, you know if you looked at that Banfield frequency change which was outside of peak hours so it's not during the period when it's most crowded you know if, if you took those service hours and applied them to buses how much bus service could you have kept on the table for people who don't have another choice? I mean. And I think in all our cases, we're, we're trying, and we'll hear obviously from the public about this, but I think that uh, choice you're describing, I think is a false choice. Um, and we're trying to keep this bus service whole, but we are dealing with some very specific single trips where we have a very low level of ridership. Mm -hmm. Um, and frankly, that's just not where mass transit should, should be working. We should be working where we can carry uh, large numbers of people, investing our, our scarce resources in those situations. Okay. If we can step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, we got into this because we're building high capacity transit aggressively and then right. we hit a downturn in the economy. Um, as we look at the future expansion of high capacity transit, and, and there really isn't a next line on the uh, in the mix right now with uh, at least the postponement of Lake Oswego uh, and uh, Southwest Quarter still very early in the planning phases, but should we be looking at different mechanisms to pace this so that maybe we don't open lines quite so fast or maybe we have required that we have bigger reserves in the bank uh, before we open lines so that we're able to weather a downturn without having to cut other service that we didn't plan to have to change? Well, I think, I think you raise a, a, a very good point, and I would say that um, one of the important things I think for us to learn out of the last uh, two recessions, really, and frankly, to be honest with you, one of the difficult things about the 2008 recession was that we hadn't fully recovered from the recession that was earlier mm -hmm. in the year 2000, or the early 2000s. Um, and so there's a number of things I think we learned from that. One is that the TriMet Board long-term policy of having two to three months of working capital is not just a nice to do, it's uh -huh. really an essential element uh -huh. of a stable system. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that we have to keep our capital stock, including our bus fleet, current. Uh -huh. uh, the situation we found ourselves in when I became general manager is that we had this uh, dramatic downturn. We had postponed bus purchases during the worst part of that for a couple of years but because we had also done that in the early 2000s, we ended up with a very old fleet. Mm -hmm. And so we're now in a position where our back is against the wall. And frankly, we have to replace buses. Um, and so I've been, and part of this next budget will continue the aggressive uh, replacement of our bus fleet and recapitalization of our bus fleet. Um, so, I th and there are other elements of the system's capital replacement that I, we have to pay similar attention to. Mm -hmm. um, with operating reserves, with a, up-to-date uh, capital uh, plant, it's possible to skip a year or two of bus replacement then and use reserves to, to uh, glide us over a recession. Uh, we weren't in that position. The other part of it is, as you well know, everybody knows, that this recession was much deeper and much longer lasting than any that we've seen really since the 1930s. So I'm not sure that it would have been great public policy 
to base it on that worst uh -huh. case outcome. Uh, we just need to recognize that we now need to grow out of that and be in a position where we can uh, can restore some of that service, which is, uh, as, as you know, is one of my key priorities, is restoring particularly our frequent service. Well, that, that's actually not the order I was going to ask the question in, but uh, I'll ask it now since you brought it up. Uh, when do you anticipate that we'll be able to restore some of the service to the frequent service lines? Well, I think we have to look at some of the economic trends and also, uh, and I know we'll get into this more, is our labor contract. Uh -huh. We have an arbitration that's now scheduled for mid-May. Um, uh, on the table is uh, about uh, five million dollars of additional service okay. reduction. We'll or, come back to that. Or fix. Let's, let's hold that for now. We'll so with that, that's that's uh -huh. key. If uh -huh. we if we win that one, um, and if the economy performs somewhat better than it's intended, if federal funds don't end up being cut, we mm -hmm. actually could be back to the pos a position where we're restoring frequent service uh, the second half of uh, of our next uh, fiscal year. Uh, 13. Um, if we, if those things don't line out that same way, uh, I can't predict, uh, and we'll have to look at what the lines of uh, revenue growth and cost tell us. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about the hard choices, um, there's a suggestion that our readers often make that was not in the mix, which is to make the max service more efficient by closing some stations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have remarked that there are some stations very close to each other in the Lloyd District, uh, in the downtown retail core, and then probably the number one favorite that people mentioned is Kings Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly I know from streetcar experience that if you can make any segment of the line go faster, you recoup a lot of service hours that you can redeploy as service elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, given that we are making painful trade-offs, why wouldn't we put some of those painful trade-offs on the table to look at? I mean, I, I know each station has a constituency, but um, there are constituencies that are gonna suffer a lot of pain through these cuts. Uh, why couldn't we include that in the mix? Well, first thing I'd, I'd say is I think it's a valuable conversation to have, uh, but it's a, it's, it takes a broad community conversation uh -huh. to do that. As you noted, each station has its own constituency. I'd also say it's not free to close a station. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, it's probably a million and a half to two million dollars because what is required is a rewiring of the signal system, as well as the change in the physical environment. So there's, there's cost, uh, capital costs associated with closing the stations. Um, and then when you're in the downtown area, you also have to think about how that uh, inter, inter relates with the downtown signal grid and the timing and the priority of all that. So it would take a certain amount of study and understanding of that before those proposals went ahead. I would tell you, and as you well know, is on our newer lines, we have followed the standard of much broader stations, so, uh, spacing. So if you begin to look at the, the mall, you know, it's roughly every four blocks we have a, a station. And I think that's working very well um, from a, both the standpoint of throughput and time spent on the mall um, and in terms of customer service. So I think there are better trade-offs. and. Um, you know, I've heard Kings Hill, I've also heard Skidmore, uh, which is often very busy during the weekends because of um, Saturday market. So those are, those are questions out there, but you're absolutely right that every station was there because there was constituency and a desire to do those. So if, if a difficult time like this is not the time to have that conversation, what is the time to have that conversation? Well, I, I'd say that this is a time to have that conversation, but I, I would also say that it's not an immediate fix given the capital cost and given um, the timeline uh, associated with doing that work, uh, a decision is probably, frankly, a couple of years off before you'd see the results. Uh -huh. So it's not, uh, it's, not a, you know, it's not a quick fix. It's not a fix to the next year's budget. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at it as a community. Perhaps we should. Um, and I'd, I'd be very curious about the views of your, um, your, your readership on that. Okay. Well, we can spin up a thread on that and get you some <laughs> input. Good. Going back to the the current package that, that came out today for balancing the budget. Um, uh, eliminating free rail zone is still part yes. of the package. Yes. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate about uh, the impact on ridership. Um, I think part of the discussion we've heard is that uh, previously Fairless Square, now free rail zone, have kind of an iconic role in the central city of Portland, particularly the downtown. Um, if free rail zone does indeed go away, can you see anything that could replace that iconic value uh, and sort of 
help preserve the, the way people think about downtown and mobility in downtown? Well, hey, that's actually a great question. And it's one, actually, I was chatting with uh, the chair of the uh, Old Town Chinatown Neighborhood Association raising that same, very same question. And I think the answer to that is that it is somehow the, the overall transit system here in Portland. Now, particularly that we've got light rail running east-west and north-south. North, we have the streetcar system that provides great mobility as well. I think it's this great transit access that we have in downtown and almost, as I said before, almost a moving sidewalk of trains right on cue behind me here, of course, <laughs> is, uh, is, is what I think we should be promoting, which is that we really have a great transit system, and we do. And uh, the center of the service and the best service in the region is actually downtown. You know, I, I think about free rail zone as well, and I think a lot of the conversation I have with people are is the same feeling that I have, which is a little sort of recognizing that perhaps the the policy reasons for fair free rail zone have passed us. It was originally an air quality related um, mitigation. Those air quality problems do not exist, thank heavens, anymore. Um, and so, but it has been part of our life, and so I, I mourn it along with, uh, with everybody else in terms of the board's consideration of the final budget. But I do think that it is time because the service is so good, so ubiquitous in downtown. Uh, I think it's worth the price. The other side um, of this is also, I think everybody I talk to about this also recognizes that having a fair paid uh, system downtown allows another level of security to be applied to the trains and our fare inspectors do provide that by the ability to confront a, a customer and say may I see your fare please uh, that's what has essentially been the broken tail light for us in terms of making sure that uh, civil behavior and a good standard of civil behavior occur uh, on our trains and so we're looking forward to increasing that presence and that enforcement in downtown and hopefully we'll see an improvement in the civility of, of, um, of the environment um, as well.